first time um, coming to the, anything that the Women's Club has done. I want to just, and you're new to us, I just want to make sure that you know who we are. Uh, our mission is to support and promote Democratic Party principles and platforms. And that inc includes equality of opportunity, a level playing field, and fair and equal treatment for everyone. Some people have asked why a women's democratic club? And that's a really fair question. Um, but women do more than half the work in the workplace, in clubs, in organizations, and in life. We set the table for men to exercise power and control. We don't wanna just set the table anymore. We want to sit at the table. We don't just want to sit at the table, we want to write the agenda. And we need to be vigilant. And that's one of the purposes of what this club is, is to help us write the agenda. We need to be vigilant about more than just our reproductive rights. We need to support our sisters who are focused on that, but and protecting these rights, but we need to to, in order to set the table, we need education and knowledge, and, and we need to bring other women along with us. All politics is local. We need to start where we can, we need to learn, and we need to exercise the power of collective effort to push that agenda our way. We are not a club of tea, cookies, and ladies who lunch. Um, so, let me give you just a, 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 some, some really um, ground rules for tonight so that everybody uh, has a really pleasant experience. As we're not gonna be asking, they're not gonna be formal questions. If you've got a name tag on, we'll recognize you, you raise your hand. And as long as it's a productive exchange, we can and, and should be flexible with timing. But this event is going to end at 8.30. Uh, the, the panel, the programming part of it. And the purpose is to listen and to learn what the community wants and the community needs. I'm gonna be running the meeting. There will be no grandstanding. Um, you will get to the question that you, ask, that you wanna ask. Everyone will be polite and courteous to one another. And there will be no cross-talking. And by that, by that, I will stop I will stop everything if there are conversations, say, between people, uh, because that destroys uh, the, the, the meeting for everyone, because people can't hear what's going on in front. So there are people in here that have hearing disabilities. There are all kinds of people. All of us have, have our issues. So no cross-talking right, with your neighbors. All right, thank you very much. And for that, you know, we really do have a great panel. Um, we do have even uh, Carmen Lopez, who is with the Registrar of Voters. But yes, yeah, so I'm gonna. So this is, this is, this is going to be a fantastic meeting, and we're going to learn how we need to bring women out to vote. We think if we can increase women's voting, then we will. Women vote, tend to vote Democratic. We'll just put it that way. They have the same principles that, that we do, family, and we'll, we'll increase the possibilities of getting a progressive candidate on the city council. Uh, I'm gonna start with Sandra. Oh, wait a minute. Uh, so, Georgette, you're a fluent Spanish speaker? Okay, so if Sandra has some issues with some of the words, she's, she's, um, she doesn't feel so comfortable uh, in, in English, we, she'll say the word in Spanish and you can help her, okay? Good evening, my name is Sandra Garota. Okay, okay, okay. I'm part of the San Diego Socialist Campaign. Uh, District 9 is very important to us because it represents the forgotten in political campaigns. Walking by City Heights, you can see social inequality and misery, and workers who live there constantly, they constantly bring the topic of better salaries and working conditions. Could we ask the speakers to stand? Oh. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, Sandra, um, hold the mic closer to your mouth. Okay. 
So, um, workers have experienced uh, long periods of intense exploitation and their employers haven't had any consideration for the social consequences that this brings. Uh, their leaders have abandoned the principles of the working class and have embraced the formula of their ruling class. Since also their union leaders are closely linked to the capitalist parties, there is very little, no political identification with the current political parties. Uh, the real people have not been listened to. What makes San Diego's socialist campaign different is that our campaign is not traditional. For the first time, people from the community will be running for city council. That's why I'm here speaking on behalf of the workers, as we say in Mexico, sin pelos en la lengua, straight to the point, and about what San Diego Socialist Campaign stands for. San Diego Socialist Campaign goal is to represent the working class majority in city heights. We don't have the intention to be the negotiator between the entrenched interests of capitalists and millionaires and their organizational representatives as such as the Chamber of Commerce, Business and Trade Groups, the Union Tribune, or any other formal or informal representatives of the local 1%. We unapologetically fight for the interests of working people and will not compromise in representing their interests. We will not make back deals, backroom deals, sell out our community, and will be publicly accountable to the community we represent. To ensure this, we will not take any money from corporations or their intermediaries. Our platform is built through community dialogue, and all of our prospective candidates have to go through a democratic and transparent selection process. Individual ambition, connections with entrenched power, and access to big donors will not determine our candidates or campaign. Should I continue? Yes, please. Yes, okay. Our campaign is built through active participation in the struggles that confront the working class majority in City Heights, opposing police and ICE brutality and racial profiling, fighting unconditionally and without backing down from the demand for $15 an hour minimum wage and supporting full inclusion and protection for undocumented immigrants. We do not see this as negotiating chips or subjects of interest only during the select election time. We are from these communities and live these experiences. The policies we advocate for will affect us directly. Our candidate will stand up and oppose the racist campaigns targeting communities of color in San Diego, such as the curfew sweeps in City Heights, Operation Lemon Drop in Lemon Grove, and the implementation of California Panel, uh, Penal Code 182.5 throughout San Diego. These campaigns originate within current government, especially led by San Diego Attorney General Bonnie Dumani who has focused her time in office in criminalizing, incriminating uh, working class communities of color, especially San Diego's African American community. Yes, one, okay. We not only seek working people's votes, but we also aim to use our campaign to, to help organize the community itself. The electoral process and the method of the Democratic and Republican establishment is to view the people in City Heights as voting cattle who are expected to become passive bystanders to the political process after election votes are counted. Our campaign will be also be in the workplaces, campuses, and in the street as we seek to encourage people in the community of City Heights to use our campaign as a means to help organize and fight in their own interests where they work, go to school, and interact with, brother, with the broader society. Thank you. and then we will ask questions. Oh. My name is Sandra Galindo. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to City Heights. Um, I first want to thank the, uh, the Women's Club for hosting this conversation, the very critical conversation there, that we hardly speak about. We have an opportunity to elect a representative of District 9 
hopefully that will come from the community that's been in the community for, for, for uh, quite a while. Uh, my name is Georgia Gomez and I'm running for to be uh, the council representative for this district, for District 9. I've been in the community, I've been in City Heights for over eight years and possibly even longer if I go back during my college years. I went to San Diego State. That's where I received my degree on environmental natural resource geography. I currently work at a nonprofit organization, Environmental Health Coalition. I've been there for over 11 years working on developing um, policies that will address the environmental injustices occurring in low-income communities. I've been working with residents, really working on empowering residents to become more active and, and really be the influencer of what happens in their communities. And I want to continue doing that work. I've been involved in City Heights for over eight years. I was part of the redevelopment um, area committee. I'm currently part of the City Heights planning group. I've been, uh, I supported the very first farmer's market that came into City Heights. That was a, a very successful market that provided, it brought fresh organic produce to this community that hardly has any good quality food. So um, I'm excited that I was part of that. I'm currently um, involved in really bringing more resources into the community to improve the walking and biking infrastructure. Um, so I've been working a lot in developing po um, policies that would improve uh, communities like District 9. Historically, we know that District 9 has been neglected, and I want to work on ensuring that th that no longer happens. We have issues related to the cost of living. Those that have, have a lot, and they continue to earn more, and those that have not, don't have, and we're in the, the disparities are getting bigger. So we really need to address that. And that impacts the quality of housing that we have. We have a shortage of affordable housing. I've been doing some affordable housing in other communities. I wanna bring public and private partnerships to really provide more accessible housing for this community and wanna really push on, on those issues that are hardly happening right now. Um, there are infrastructure issues related in this community, but I don't mean I don't mean potholes. We gotta look beyond that. There is lack of lighting. People do not feel safe and they don't come out. So we really need to improve that. The walkability of this community is impacted negatively. So we really need to address those issues. So there's a lot of issues that are occurring in this community. I'm very familiar with them because I see them every day being part of this community um, at, for over eight years. So this is why I work out, this is why I'm running for city council. I wanna bring the work that I've done as an active, proactive resident of this community, and I wanna bring that at city council and really partner with the community to move those issues forward. Thank you. Go in order uh, of the. I'm sorry. Yeah, okay. Um, Araceli. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for being here, and thank you for the, to the Democratic Women's Club for hosting this great event, so that we can all gather some good information and be able to make that a very important decision that we have at the ballot box next June. Um, my name is Araceli Martinez. I'm running for City Council District 9. I've been a resident of the community for 18 years. I don't think any candidate can say that on me. I've lived in the college area. I've lived in City Heights. And I've lived in Talmadge. And I've, now I currently I live in Kensington. Really, it's South Kensington. I've heard some people call it Bamboo Gardens. Um, but I am on the cusp, I'm on Mead Avenue, so I see uh, both worlds. I see the world that is Kensington and the affluency that people are talking about. And then I also walk one block down to El Cajon Boulevard and um, I experience that world as well. And as I do every day where, um, you know, just being part of the community. Um, I want to run a platform of infrastructure. I think that's very important. Um, as Georgette was mentioning, it does go beyond um, potholes. We need uh, to bring affordable housing. There's a big shortage of affordable housing here in the community. 
Um, people uh, tend to live together. There's the low income, um, obviously, issue. The, the community is not making the progress that uh, we could be making because of the strength and energy that is in the community. Um, uh, streets, definitely, we need sidewalks, we need um, the roads, we need the lighting. And I also want to make sure that the uh, trolley station um, gets built here. Uh, we have those two platforms on Alcohol Boulevard and on University. And yes, currently we have the 235 bus that takes people in you know, north and south. And um, But we do need to bring in the trolley this way. We need to make sure that those uh, stations get opened and become fully functional so that we can get, um, you know, the more walkable communities that we're looking for so that we can get the um, you know, the bike-friendly communities because, as we all know, um, on, on bus systems, you can put two, bu two bikes at the front of the bus and then everybody else has to wait for the next bus. Um, so that's another thing for me. Um, um, having been a member of the community for such a long time and having essentially grown up in the community um, since I was 18 onward, um, I too, you know, experienced firsthand uh, riding the bus system, I know, you know, taking the 7 every day on University Avenue, the 15 up and down El Cajon Boulevard, the 13 to San Diego State, where I, I too went to San Diego State. Um, I majored in political science, I majored in psychology, and both of those fields have really been helpful uh, for me in my current field. I'm an attorney, I do family law, and I do education rights. Um, so in the area that I'm in, um, to be able to uh, counsel people who are going through the really difficult times in their lives that, um, you know, the transitions that they have to be um, going through, both those degree degrees have been really helpful for me to be able to focus um, on my clients. Um, I do education rights. I go out there and I advocate for kids with special needs um, all over San Diego County, including here in District 9, uh, get the services that they need uh, in their schools and if the school can't provide for them there then you know then we have to make some other tough decisions and um, possibly move uh, to other schools where they can get the services that they need um, i've done a lot of volunteer work as well throughout the years throughout my entire lifetime again both here in district 9 and all over san diego and even as a child growing up in imperial county um, out of just uh, a sheer willingness and that's just who i am uh, I would go do park cleanups, I would go do graffiti cleanups, even as a 10, 11, 12 year old. Um, here in, in, in San Diego in District 9, uh, I've gone and spoken to um, students at Hoover High School about the importance of staying in school and um, you know, going to college and having those positive role models available to them and making myself available to them. Um, I precinct walked um, on behalf of the Labor Council up and down the streets here in District 9 uh, back in 2010 uh, when uh, uh, now Governor Brown was running for election. Um, I, I, even in my own uh, neighborhood without needing any specific title, I just go out there and if I see that my alley is a big mess, I will just pick up a broom and I, I just want to make my neighborhood clean and beautiful. And that's, you know, I take the initiative myself to take care of that. Um, if I see that nobody else is, st is stepping up and doing it. Um, all over San Diego County, I just volunteered uh, recently um, to go clean the uh, Ocean Beach uh, Riverfront. Um, that was a very enjoyable activity and it makes me feel good to do the volunteer work. Um, again, uh, without pay, without title. Um, last week, um, I was in Sacramento. I don't normally speak like this, as a matter of fact, but I was out there talking to legislators about uh, workers' issues. Um, we were asking uh, the, one of the bills that we were talking about on behalf of Consumer Attorneys of California, which represents plaintiffs um, and really people, consumers, all over the state. 
to get workers to not be forced into arbitration agreements, which some employers right now can't do, and they make it a condition of employment. So we were asking that you be hired on the merits, and then if you want to at some point enter into an arbitration agreement, then you can do so after the fact. But it shouldn't be a hiring decision, and it shouldn't be a terminating decision. I was also up there asking for increased court funding. I don't know if anybody here is aware, but the courts have lost $1.1 billion, and so I'm up there volunteering my time on behalf of all people so that we can bring justice locally, just as we're saying, all politics is local, and we have to go up there and ask for these things so that we can then feel the effects here in the community. So, again, I do volunteer in the community. I've lived here 18 years, and I volunteer all over San Diego County, all over the state, and I want to make sure that our voice not only gets brought together here and heard, echoed here and in City Hall and beyond. Thank you. Thank you, Arizona. Can those of you in the back hear? Okay. I just want to check to make sure. Okay, Sarah. Sarah, would you pronounce your last name for me? Saez. Saez. Like Joan Baez, if anybody remembers who that is. All right. Yes, exactly. How appropriate. My name is Sarah. I'm program director at United Taxi Workers in San Diego. Our office is right down the street on Fairmont. I walked here today. I live down the street off of 43rd and University. I've lived here about five years. I live here because I was actually gentrified out of downtown. Me and my partner came to San Diego. We're both urban dwellers, and we went to downtown San Diego and thought that was our spot. And unfortunately, it was not, and our rent went up. So we came to City Heights, and we couldn't be happier. Unfortunately, our rent just went up in City Heights as well. They just called City Heights an up-and-coming neighborhood, and we all know what that means, which is one of the issues I want to address. But I have not decided to run yet. Um, because I want to listen and to people and I want to see what people want um, This campaign is not about me. It's about you um, and it's about what the community wants um, So I cannot come up here and say vote for me. Um, I want you to vote for yourself and the issues that matter to you um, So I would just you know, I, I want to talk about that right now But I'll tell you a little bit about my background because um, I, I guess that's important um, I'm I started my activism when I lived in Dominican Republic um, for over a year. It's a third world country um, there, I saw poverty like I've never seen before. I grew up in Boston, um, but it was nothing compared to what I saw in the campo, in the country, in Dominican Republic. Um, so when I was there, I decided I'm gonna join the Peace Corps, not realizing that you have to have a college degree to join the Peace Corps. <laughs> so um, that didn't work out. So I ended up going to college. I got a degree in sociology and critical criminology, which means that I studied the prison industrial complex and I feel very passionate about um, a majority of African-American men being in prison as opposed to college. I think this is a serious systemic issue. Um, and then after that, while I was in college, my first labor activism came with um, farm workers in Immokalee, Florida. Um, they were uh, demanding one cent more per pound of tomato. They were being pistol whipped in the fields. Um, and I was able to join successful campaigns against Taco Bell and Burger King. Um, and then I also worked on this campaign called Take Back the Land, um, where we actually created a village called Emoja Village, um, where homeless people could live on a vacant lot. Um, I'm sure a lot of you know there's more than two times empty houses than there are homeless folks. So we're dealing with a capitalistic crisis in our country. I don't think that we can solve a lot of it from city council, but I think that it's a platform for us to start discussing these things. And there's a lot of trans, um, transformative things that we can do on the city council um, to change these things, like homelessness in City Heights. Um, like I said, I work at the Labor Council building and we let people sleep in our parking lot every night. Um, they shouldn't have to do that. Um, and then I was also a Medicare volunteer and um, now obviously at United Taxi Workers. And our United Taxi Workers are amazing. Um, they help pass one of the most significant um, labor victories, policy victories in this recent history in San Diego. Um, over 500 of them lined out outside of City Hall. Um, and that's just an example. And a majority of them, 94% are immigrants. 
over 70% are African refugees, um, and they are not usually involved in this process. So through my work in United Taxi Workers, I spend a lot of time on the 10th floor <laughs> at City Hall, and I see how inaccessible it is. Um, I also have recently got involved in advocacy around Civic San Diego. Again, meetings at 3 p.m. on a Wednesday where you have to pay 15 bucks for parking um, just to say, don't gentrify my neighborhood. Um, ask me first before you develop here. Um, so, and I'm gonna kind of be all over the place with this, but infrastructure, we want to talk about infrastructures. Potholes and lights are important, but what we also have to talk about is po project labor agreements. Who is building our, you know, who is filling our potholes? Who are building our buildings? Um, if, if these developers come into our neighborhoods and they don't agree to pro uh, hire people from the local community, it's hurting our communities. Um, so also I recently got my um, master's degree. Um, I went to law school for a year and I dropped out. I'm a law school dropout um, because I'm, I'm on the ground. I'm an organizer. I'm always gonna be an organizer. So I went and got my master's degree um, in nonprofit management and leadership. Um, and basically I, if I decide to run, I wanna run because I want to include people. I wanna include under, underserved communities. In the last election, a majority of the people who came out were white um, and they weren't even from you know, communities, working class, District 9 for the majority is a working class community. Um, so my impetus to run is also to run outside of the establishment. I know I go to these dinners and I go to these breakfasts and it's not, again, accessible to people. And I see this um, from the lens that I'm coming from and I want people to feel like they have a choice. Um, so that's why I'm here. I'm so excited that your choice is um, many women of color here. Um, that's so exciting for me. Um, but I just, I want people to have the opportunity. Um, our president, Mikhail Hussein, is on the City Heights Town Council. That's beautiful, you know? Um, and I think as an organizer, that's what I want to bring to City Hall. I also want other people who want to run to feel like they can run if they're not part of the establishment. It's okay if you're not shaking hands at breakfasts and dinners. If you serve your community and you know what your community wants, run for office. We should welcome that. So um, I look forward to your questions. Uh, thank you. Um, I actually, I'm going to hold the, um, the, the timer uh, toward you guys so you can see it. I think that might be better. Right, come, come again. <coughs> well, good, after, good evening, everybody. My name is Caridad Sanchez. Uh, I'm a resident of South Press, so I'm at the southern, southern tip of District 9. Um, and I, I'm really, actually, re really very excited that I, you, I was part of the process we, uh, to draw these new districts, and it was a very exciting process, something that we hadn't done uh, in terms of talking to other communities about what this should look like um, and what San Diego would look like. And, and we put together a shared sort of vision of what San Diego would look like um, some time ago. So I am also very excited, like Sarah, to see that there are opportunities and there are lots of women up here. And of course, there are also, also there's also men in the audience who are, um, are, are looking at this race. And, and the reason that I'm here, like Sarah, I haven't decided to run, but the reason that I, I am thinking this thoroughly through uh, is because I have a stake in District 9, as much, as much as you have a stake in District 9. And I feel it so, so passionately within my heart um, because I have a three-month-old, which you heard crying uh, earlier, uh, and I have a four-year-old. And these are, these are like, this is my future, right? Just like our kids are our future. Um, that's my stake in this district, what this city looks like, what my council district looks like, what the priorities are. Do we have a progressive council that's gonna push policies that bring communities, that uplift communities? that uh, really help working class folks get out, get ahead, provide equity in the distribution of resources and the projects and the things that we're looking at. And you know, a lot of the decisions that are being made at City Hall are ones that are not backed up by, you know, where, we, where the need is actually located, right? Um, and that's not, that's not necessarily a problem of this person or that person. I mean, there really needs to, there needs to be data behind how we distribute those resources. And I know that folks are working on that. I know that our council member has been working on that. Um, but, but, but really, I'm here exploring this opportunity and, and because there's so much at stake, right? Especially in 2016, where this council could go many ways, but it needs to grow progressive. And we need to work together to elect people that are gonna do things that are right for the community. Um, City Heights has so many advantages, uh, but there are a lot of folks that still need, right? We, as we look, as I look at, I look out and think about this run and think about why District 9 is important is because it's a microcosm of what San Diego is. We have Kensington Talmadge, right, where there's the well-to-do folks, and then there's South Crest, and there's City Heights, the, 
all these places, particularly City Heights and South Press and some of these places, we don't have access to a lot of stuff. You know, I, I realized the other, the, I realized over the couple of years that we've, uh, probably almost nearly 10 years that we lived uh, in, in South Crest Mountain View, that we really drive outside of our community to get the things that we need. Um, we do have a North Gate, uh, but I have to go, you know, I have to do stuff beyond that, right? Uh, where do I go get, a co where do I go get coffee in the morning? Where do I take my kids out to play? In fact, on my way over here, four kids uh, from the from our little complex came in to play with uh, with Nico, which is why he's not here. Um, why can't we play at the park? Um, so what what we what what I think about in terms of how important District Nine is is it's it's the people, right? And it's this it's this really cro it's a, it's a tough district, right? Because you have these folks that uh, have priorities, and sometimes those priorities come are, are they're not, they're not the same, and so you're trying to figure out what you do. Uh, and how you you really equitably represent people and provide the resources that they need. And there is no doubt that in this district, we re we require more resources than other parts of the city. Quite frankly, because we're far behind, because we have broken dis because we have bad sidewalks, and we have po I mean, hey, listen, I, I, potholes are our big problem. You can't ride a I mean, it's it's terribly dangerous to r to ride a bicycle across a pothole. Uh, we don't have enough open space. We don't have enough safe space. Who comes out at night? Nobody comes out in South Crest. It walks around at night. Um, the, the 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 lady that does the that owns a nail shop down the street from my house keeps the bar. She keeps the doors locked, and as a client comes in, she'll open the door. Um, and that's that's a scary thing for a small business, right? And it's just her and her her aunt who uh, run the business. And I'm really excited that's there. We also have across the street across the street from my complex uh, a dry cleaning business, and there's already always someone there. Um, and so these are all things that I think need to be addressed, which is why I'm seriously looking. At this race, and I'm very excited that there are a lot of options. There was a time and a day where there weren't enough, there weren't enough options, um, and this is a good problem to have. And I'm really proud to stand up here with all these women and get to know them more, and to get to know you more, and hopefully you'll get to know me a little bit more. Regardless of what I what I've done, I worked for Senator Boxer. I worked for Senator Boxer ten years. Susan Davis before that for four years. I've had the opportunity to look at this county in a in a, in a this region. Um, and to identify priorities um, in City Heights, I can't, you know, I can't take full credit for anything that's done. You work for staff and elected official, you don't take credit for things. But I can say that in a state as large as California, uh, a senator re really relies on her staff to push priorities. And so I've been able to work on wonderful things like, like my boss chairs the transportation committee. We're going to write a transportation bill. How do we steer those resources? I mean, we really do have to fend off Republicans and other folks who don't want to put money into mass transport and public transportation. And so those are things that that I have worked on. One, two of the things that I that I've been able to be of help in this district um, was the the uh, paying appropriations money that went aside uh, that was set aside to uh, extend the green line to San Diego State. And also we advocated and we were successful in uh, setting aside funding so that City Heights could uh, renovate and expand its its health center. So those are really important things to me. apologize because at the beginning before we started I was supposed to recognize that there is another candidate here uh, Ricardo um, Ricardo um, was not invited to speak on the panel uh, because he is a man <laughs> and we are a women's club so we will give him less time to talk he only gets a minute well good evening Good evening, everybody. My name is Ricardo Flores, and I'm also a candidate for District 9. And a little bit about myself, uh, I have deep roots in the community. You know, my family actually met at San Diego State. Uh, they had the opportunity at some point to purchase their home, and they purchased a home in City Heights, and that became my first home. Uh, my father actually was a teacher at Euclid Elementary School in City Heights, where he started his public service career. And I actually started my public service career here in San Diego with Congresswoman Susan Davis as well about seven years ago. And for the past three or so years, I've been working with Marty Emerald as her chief of staff. So I have a lot of history in this community. A lot of, I've done a lot of work in this community. And currently, I'm the chief of staff for Councilmember Marty Emerald. So, you know, we've done a lot of work. I've done a lot of work in this community. And actually, I wanted to share with all of you today some, some news. Uh, I just got endorsed by all the Democratic women from the city council. That's Councilman Myrtle uh, Cole, uh, Emerald, and also Leitner. So I'm really excited about that. And I think that's a testament not only to the work that I've done, but to the work that our office has done. In the past few years, we've actually gotten $13 million for parks, $2 million for skate parks, $14 million for fire stations, and about $3 million for lights. And that's all in City Heights. And those are promises that the city has not been able to meet, but we have, and there's more to do. So thank you very much, and I look forward to meeting all of you. Thank you. Um, before we 
we start the question and answer uh, section, I just want to uh, recognize that we have a uh, we also have a candidate for District 1 here, Joe LaCava. We're not going to give him time to talk because it, this is not District 1, this is District 9. So uh, from now on, um, we are going to um, recognize the audience. We do have uh, Carmen Lopez, who she's from the Registrar of Voters. And Carmen will also be chiming in to answer questions as, we, um, as, as you ask them. And I see in the back, um, John uh, Stamp? Stomp. So I will recognize you first. Thank you. Uh, just a first question. What is your position on the use of the zoo tax? Each year, the city of San Diego writes a $12 million blank check to Zoo Global. It is a tax that most adversely affects renters. It costs renters about $100 a year. Um, the zoo has no commitment to hire locally. The zoo has a non-local board. And it's got a budget that contains uh, reserves that are twice as great as their uh, operating expense. So what do you think should happen, including should we get rid of it, the zoo tax? Anyone, anyone want to take that on, Georgia? Yeah. So, um, so I do believe that if the city is giving, supporting any institution um, to, to operate, there should be accountability to that money. I mean, the city ha is responsible to manage our money, and they're not doing it with the suit, and it's very unfortunate. Related to City Heights, I mean, I don't know how many of us can actually go to the zoo because it's very expensive. So there should be uh, reductions of residents uh, from the city of San Diego that they should be deducted in the cost to be able to access that luxury, really. It shouldn't be just for the tourists. I think it's wrong. Now, if there's, there's no local hire, there should be local hire, specifically from areas that have high um, unemployment area, City Heights is one of those areas. So we should look at that as well. Um, I know the Sioux, right now we have an environmental, we have environmental issues that we're gonna be facing. Climate, climate, um, the, our climate is changing, so we really need to look at what is the Sioux's role in addressing the climate impacts. There's water issues, and the suit definitely utilizes a lot of water. So there should be restrictions and we should work on them with them to really meet those requirements related to the climate, to really meet, make it more accessible to our residents and provide jobs that could be available to communities like District 9. That's what I believe. Can we take you another question? Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, just real quick. I think the zoo is the same problem as Civic San Diego where we're using tax money, our money, on things we don't need. Um, I would say that I would put it towards, first of all, District 9. Um, we're looking for free bus passes for, for kids in our neighborhoods, free bus passes for um, students who go to City College, but we can't afford that. Um, so I think um, I think it should be going towards things like that. But ultimately, I think what um, you know the amazing work that CPI is doing. Why don't we have a community participatory budget process where we can all figure out together where that money goes? I agree as well that if the tax is. Um, going to be remain in place that it should be accountable the zoo should be accountable to the residents of the city um, Sea World for example does pay taxes to the city. That's a revenue source for the city uh, The zoo should be doing that as well. Um, I know that it is more affordable than Sea World, but um, not affordable to the residents in this community um, just as much and so either the, it should be abolished or yes, there should definitely be accountability. I want to think, oh, okay. So can you translate, uh, Rafael, for me? Okay. Okay, so um, 
Yo creo que este tax se le está cobrando a la comunidad del City High. Tenemos cosas mucho más importantes. Tenemos un alto nivel de población que es indocumentada y que no reciben con sus bajos salarios estampillas de comida. Y durante el, los meses de verano, los hijos, esos hijos no comen. Entonces, el dinero se está usando en, en algo que realmente no beneficia a la comunidad, como, como sería meterlo en, en, en comida y en... en, en And I also want to add to what you said that she also said that in the summer months, some families go without eating because um, they, they're not getting enough in the uh, food. Center. Yes, but because they don't go to school. If they don't have the two meals that normally they receive at schools. So summertime for parents with documents or no documents, yeah. it's, we struggle, you know, we struggle. Uh, uh, spring breaks, uh, whatever, <laughs> two weeks or three weeks or whatever we have at the, we don't have school. It's a really, it's a challenge for low-income parents. And if we consider that 80% of the community here makes less than $12.50 an hour, can you imagine all these parents struggling and, and not allowing their kids to open the refrigerator because it can affect their next day's meal? So I think that money should be directed to, to children because eventually these children of undocumented parents are going to be the ones in charge of this country. And they're not being, they don't, ellos no están alimentándose bien. Yo creo que deberíamos invertirle en los niños que son nuestro futuro, tengan documentos o no. They're not eating well, we should invest in the children um, of our communities, whether they're documented or not. Okay, just tell me your name. Yeah. Uh, hi, Mark Tran. Um, I've been a, a uh, resident of City Heights for 15 years. I'm a now resident of the college area, so I think I've lived in district time my whole life. My question to all the candidates is, what are you going to do concrete? Um, uh, what's your concrete plan on how to engage and make yourself more accessible to the constituents of this district? Uh, I think it's really important, Myrtle Cole does this, we need a district office in District 9. I'm, I'm a little biased, I think it should be in City Heights, I think it's central enough that I think everybody would be okay to that. Um, and I think that there should be regular meetings. Um, actually, if I run, I want to have town hall meetings where we meet on a regular basis to get consensus from the community on whatever issues that are affecting them. Um, I would be 100% accessible because like I said, it's not about me, it's not about Sarah Sai is running, it's about the community. So I think just putting yourself out there um, and demanding a district office um, that is accessible to the community here. In agreement with Sarah, I think uh, having more meetings in the community related to issues that are uh, that will be impacting the community is critical. Right now, we just we're, we're going through the city budgeting process. And there hasn't been a single meeting in the community to discuss what are those benefits for District 9. They all happen in downtown, and it's very unfortunate. So bringing those discussions into the district is critical. In addition to that, District 9 is very multicultural, and there's many, many different uh, languages. Uh, so really being able to have staff that can connect with the residents is very critical. Just having it, the, the conversations in English is not enough. So we really need to be responsive to that. Um, you're next, yes. Okay, so much. Um, can, oh, wait a minute, maybe I should be repeating the question. Are all of you hearing the questions? Yeah, oh, okay, okay. Yeah, I'm feeling a little sick, so please excuse me. My voice is a little shaky. Um, so, I'm with the San Diego Socialist Campaign, and you know I came here and I'm, I'm hearing uh, what you all are putting forth as your priorities, and, and something that struck me was, you know, I'm hearing, I'm an activist in the community, so I work on issues that are really important, and when I heard most people
people speak, I'm hearing about things like making our V9 more bike friendly, mm -hmm. these kind of issues. And it's not that those things aren't important, but what I want to know is what is your position on things that are really dramatically affecting working class people in the community? So did you all know that we have a district attorney, Bonnie Gumanis, who is literally, literally criminalizing young black men? She went and swept up 33 young black men because cops had put them on a gang affiliation list. They weren't even in the gang. They tried to put them in prison for the rest of their lives. How can that not be at the very top of your list? Yeah. Okay, so what about the curfew sweeps in City Heights? Where on Friday nights we go around and sweep up young black kids under 18 and introduce them to the criminal uh, or the justice system, right? We don't do it in La Jolla. Why are we curfew sweeping in La Jolla? Statistics show that people, the kids in La Jolla are both using drugs and selling drugs at just the same rate, if not higher, in those communities. Okay, Josh. Let's let him. I, I think they're ready to answer. This really is cool. what I call Green City. Bikes are 15. Yes. Uh, right now we have workers who are, we have single moms in City Heights who work full time jobs and have to skip meals. And that's because we have a minimum wage that is ridiculously low. Yes. And what I want you to do is what do you have to say about what, what the city council did when they sold out working class people and went to 1150 They got pumped to the ballot. What about you supporting $15 an hour for workers so people can actually make the Thank you, Josh. Thank you. I'm sorry, there's a time limit, and um, I wanted to say that I support the San Diego Socialist campaigns. These guys over here with the t-shirts, they're five points. One of them is, is the fight for 15. I actually was, you know, I was extremely disappointed in the fact that our minimum wage got set to 11.50. I've kind of made enemies of people for criticizing it, but I 100% think the fight for 15 should happen, and I think a city council person can, can push for that. Um, I think it should be more. I think it's supposed to be 20-something according to inflation. 100% support the $15 um, dollars, uh, minimum wage. Also, I, will, I mean, if I run, I will not take money from police unions. I think that they're part of the problems. I don't think our neighborhoods need more cops. I think that we need more resources. Um, so, I mean, I, I think it's affordable housing. Um, you know, like I said, my, my rent just went up $100. Um, I support every single platform of the socialist campaign. Um, most definitely the Fight for 15. Sorry to get to answer the last question, but I do want to answer your question. I think why bikes are important is because people get, people, because because our streets are not built uh, to for to, they're not pedestrian friendly. They're certainly not bike friendly. People are getting hurt. That's why it's important. Secondly, I have three sons. They're brown kids. I absolutely know that I have to prepare them for what could for what they could be stereotyped. There's nothing more closer. Just because I didn't bring it up doesn't mean it's not important to me. I recognize as a mother that that is something that they're going to have to deal with. Um, I, you know, as term, and with the fight for 15, absolutely. I was there. I have been at the organizing campaigns. I've been at the protests. My husband, Nico, who is on the executive board of SCIU 221, they're the guys that are leading the, five, the fight for 15. So absolutely, I'm gonna be there. Same here, I didn't get to answer the last question, but I also echo what a lot of the other candidates have said, is I also support the Five for 15. I've also been at the rallies in support of that campaign, and as far as specifics, I mentioned them in my opening um, statements, that I, I, I recognize the housing shortage and that we need to focus on that. I recognize the need for the transportation. Um, to be able to help the working families, all of, all of us, all our working families be able to get to our jobs, whether they be within the district, if we can create them here, um, or outside of the district, and in terms of creating them, yes, I also agree that project labor agreements should play a major um, role in in what actually does get built here. Um, I didn't mention it earlier, but I, I do come from a union background. My, my mom was uh, um, a union member uh, when she worked um, in L.A. in the in the fishing uh, um, uh, industry, uh, butcher industry. Um, my, uh, the, my children's father is an iron worker from Locals 229. So that's how um, I recognize that uh, it's important to um, have these agreements in place and make sure that those uh, get um, um, play, uh, at the forefront of any negotiation with developers. So those are those are specifics um, to what I think is important for the district. So I, I too agree. I think it's criminal that the folks or people that are working full time are not able to pay their rent 
or they're not able to provide food for their families. It is definitely criminal and we need to change that. Um, my background is, I come from, I'm a first immigrant um, American, Mexican American to this country. My parents came here and they had to work multiple jobs. So I understand, I lived the life of not having enough, of them having to live with another family to be able to provide us shelter. So I'm very much come from those issues and this is why I'm extremely motivated to do this. This is why I've been doing this work because those issues are real. People are getting impacted. They can't, the, the walkability, mobility is a huge issue just like the type of jobs that people are getting in this community. Not everybody is has the luxury to own a car. So public transportation is huge for this district and we need to improve it, we need to make it better, we need to make it sh cheaper. We do need to provide bus passes for our youth to go to and get access up to a better education. So there's a lot of issues that are at stake. There's, this is about surviving and having a better life, a better quality of life, and that's what I will do. already talked about this and it's very important in my canvassing at City Heights for the fight for 15 for uh, SUNU. Um, people are really, la gente necesita, el trabajador necesita la, los 15 dólares la hora para poder darle a sus hijos una vida con más dignidad. Can you translate, Marcos? Uh, workers need uh, $50 an hour to be able to uh, give their family a more uh, uh, dignity, uh, way of living. Muchos de nosotros, como por ejemplo yo, tenemos que tener dos o tres trabajos en los que nuestros hijos están todo el día solos. Entonces están siendo educados por una televisión, ¿sí? Entonces, ¿qué les estamos enseñando? Necesitamos ganar esos 15 dólares la hora para por lo menos estar un poco más de tiempo con nuestros hijos. Eh, esto es con la gente que tiene documentos, pero la gente que tiene documentos, muchos de ellos están trabajando por 1,800 dólares la hora, 14 horas al día, sin ningún día de, 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 de descanso, y están ganando 4 80 más o menos la hora. Estos abusos continúan aquí y no he escuchado, disculpen a mujeres, a ninguna otra panelista, hablar de, de los derechos y dar dignidad a, a, la, a la gente indocumentada. Entonces, City Heights necesita ser un santuario para toda la gente indocumentada, que se les dé respeto porque ellos son la base y la razón por lo que este país es primera potencia, por el trabajo de esta gente sin documentos. No quieren, quieren nuestro trabajo, pero no nos quieren ver. Basically, uh, uh, a lot of undocumented uh, uh, members of the community have to work long hours where, or several jobs where they're not at home and their kids basically are raised by the television. Um, these folks need a 15 an hour wage um, uh, to have a, a dignified, uh, livable standard of living. Uh, and so um, uh, we, we need to give a more credit to the, to the uh, undocumented workers of this community. and. Uh, um, um, Sandra mentioned that some a lot of the ladies or the ladies here haven't mentioned that as a uh, fundamental issue because uh, the undocumented workers are um, and, and immigrant work here in this country are reason why this country is number one ec economic uh, powerhouse in the world and um, and uh, we need uh, a just fair wage for immigrants here. In and she also said, talked about people making even less than minimum wage, right? Having money taken out of their check, and said they want to, uh, they want our work, but they don't want to see us. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Yes, that's right. Anyone else? I just want to just say, as a, as a. Um, officer of this club, that $15 an hour is a women's issue, and the party should own this issue. Have to wait seven years, which means that they are disenfranchised 
in this community from the political process. Would you support and would you work for a policy that enables our residents to legal, our residents to be able to vote in local elections? <laughs> Are fueling the energy and the economy in, in our communities. Yes. <laughs> do you want to say something to that? <laughs> well, first of all, um, I'm here on my personal time. <laughs> I do. I have worked for the registered voters for 11 years, and uh, and just uh, you know, uh, the candidates they're all great, but. You, one of the concerns is really um, voter turnout and civic engagement. It's it's the base of everything that we're talking about. And it's just not happening. Uh, the last non-presidential election, we had a turnout between 25 and 30 percent. That's a lousy uh, democracy that we do have. And so I think, um, you know, uh, talking about immigrants uh, voting, I know that in other states they're able to uh, vote, and that would be a, a great issue. Because uh, why, why is uh, District 9 important? I think because the way uh, District 9 looks now is the way the nation's going to look in the next decade. All the United States is going to look like, um, like City Heights in the future. And um, I just like to say about voter turnout to everyone here is really um, going back to the basics of talking to people. We have to make an investment. It's an investment of going door to door. I know people don't want to hear that because it's a lot of work, but that's a way you engage people, really. Um, a lot of times we wait right before an election and that's a huge mistake. We should be working on it right now. People getting organized. I'm sorry to say, I, there's a lot of organizations out there that blah, 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 they do a lot, they say they're doing voter registration, but they're not. Okay, and I think, you know, we all need to be aware of that. And why is it that uh, people are not turning out to vote? Because they, they don't connect with, with politics. I mean, if you're working two jobs, at McDonald's or what have you, uh, a lot of working class people, they don't have time for this. You know, they're not gonna go to a lot of meetings. Uh, they're not gonna do a lot of things. Uh, my suggestion is that when you go door to door, and this is a must, is that you do more listening than you do talking. A lot of times we get diarrhea of the mouth. <laughs> Because we want to, you know, we want to sell our product, we want to sell a candidate, but it's not about any candidate. It's about the people in the community s connecting to say, you know, this person or that person, we're, you know, we're, why is it that you don't believe in politics? Why is it? You come from different countries. We have the biggest Somali population here in the United States, I believe. Uh, we have the Vietnamese uh, population here, Latino uh, population, uh, all the immigrant population here. And each country, the reason that they're not voting is very particular to that country. Mexico, we don't like the government. We don't believe in government. For 60 years, there was one party that ruled the country. And uh, Vietnamese, the same thing, the Communist Party, they really don't have any parties to vote with. But so uh, my message to you is really getting down to the basics of investing in uh, talking to people when you go door to door. And again, the most important thing is listen, don't do the talking. What about the question though, Allo allowing um, uh, uh, more recent Im immigrants to vote? Um, who wants, to, did you have anything specific about that? That's really what the question was. I'd, I'd love it. Yeah, I 100% support that. Um,
for voter turnout. So with the help of amazing people like Ramla Saeed, um, in the last election, the East African community, his voter turnout was over 50%. Um, that is because of the work of Ramla and Hana and the United Taxi Workers, these are refugees. Um, a lot of them are eligible to vote. There's around 30,000 East Africans in San Diego. Only 5,000 are registered to vote. 100% um, support has many, everybody should be able to vote. If you live here, you should be able to vote. Um, I, I support Lorena Gonzalez's bill that she has right now that um, people can automatically register through their, um, you know, uh, through the DMV, things like that. I think it's 100%. And for the last five years, United Taxi Workers has committed itself to, to do voter turnout and has a, you know, I've almost decade long being an organizer, 100% agree with you. It's about listening to people um, and not just doing it when you're knocking on their doors around elections. Um, and that's another reason why I want to run because I feel like that's what, how politics is done in San Diego. We only knock on doors when we want to tell people what to do. Um, so I 100% support Anna's um, proposal. Um, I'm not sure if we could pass that through the city council or if that would be more like a statewide um, effort, but 100% would support that. So, I want to recognize Ramla Saeed. Uh, uh, Ramla is the organizer of this event. She's what made it happen. And I would also like to introduce her as um, the Women's Club Treasurer. Yes, membership's only $20. Okay, so, I'm sorry. So, yes, uh, I agree that that will give the work, undocumented workers, undocumented people who live here at City Heights. I think um, ellos ofrecerían la voz de ellos y, y, y la razón por la que los latinos o mucha la gente no vota es porque en nuestros países tenemos malas experiencias, pero también aquí con el Partido Demócrata, que ha sido el que ha... Eh, eh, nos ha dado más redadas a nuestras comunidades y ha hecho que se separen nuestras familias y la razón por la que nosotros emigramos aquí es por darnos una vida mejor a nuestros hijos y acabamos separándonos de ellos. Entonces eso es muy doloroso. Yo creo que sería muy bueno que se le diera el, el derecho a, a todas las personas a votar porque están pagando taxes ellos aquí, cuando pagan su renta, cuando pagan su comida, cuando pagan todo, gasolina y todo. Pero sí, la razón por la que gente no vota es también porque el, el que era menos malo se hizo más malo. ¿Por qué? Por todas las redadas y por la separación de familias. Uh, oh, I want to read a translation. Translation, and then, and then, uh, translation. Uh, so, in a nutshell, she, she said, like, yes, that she supported uh, 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 that all residents of, San, uh, of City Heights be give, granted the right to vote, whether they're documented or not. Um, it's extremely important uh, that they be given that right, and specifically, uh, uh, why Latinos and, uh, and immigrants don't feel comfortable voting for. Uh, uh, in this country is because they, we, we, there's been bad experiences in, in, other, in, other, in, their, in their countries, uh, repression, but specifically in this country, um, the Democratic Party has been, uh, you know, uh, uh, known for being the lesser of two evils to some extent, and they've been guilty for leading a campaign of mass deportation, and, 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 and because of that, a lot of the Latino community and folks, uh, you know, uh, feel that there needs to be an alternative uh, but absolutely, yes, that there should be uh, 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 an effort for uh, undocumented workers to be able to vote in, on local campaigns. Um, so I think that I heard the question as refugees being able to vote, they typically have to wait between five to seven years before they're eligible to vote. Um, I understand that that would be a change in federal law, and it's something that we would we want to pursue it, uh, with immigration reform. That's, but. That's that's my understanding. I mean, there may there may be other options. I don't know. I'm not going to speak to the, what I don't know. But but I do know that that is something that I would be supportive of. It's something uh, that that these, that we should we should extend. And, and by way of understanding this, the way that I got involved, uh, my mom was undocumented for the first ten years of my life. So I know what 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 legalization and providing resources and giving people legal status actually means. It means safety. It means not being afraid when you get on the school bus or when you get on uh, public buses. When I grew up. The Border Patrol would get on the bus and pull, pull people off. And I didn't understand the concept that I wasn't going to get pulled off. 
and I certainly didn't understand that my mom could easily get uh, uh, pulled off, and uh, one day she did, uh, but they let her go, right? And so I am a beneficiary of the 1986 amnesty, and I, I think, I think that I am a tribute to this to my mother, right? Because she left her country, she came here undocumented, she she cleaned houses for a living, but that didn't stop her from teaching me to be involved. It didn't stop her from making me go out and register voters. Uh, it didn't stop her from any, getting involved in SDOP and trying to get uh, organized. It didn't stop us from making sure that the candidates for mayor or whatever knew what our priorities were. Um, and so that's, I mean, that's all I can, that's all I can share with you. Um, Karen, am I correct in understanding that refugees um, are different from immigrants? and that refugees have a faster path to voting than um, immigrants? It's, I can, I can help. Okay. I'm going to both answer this, but there, there, there are different, different sort of different categories for folks, right? So it's, essentially it's going to be between five and 10 years for someone to be eligible to vote, depending on whether you're a refugee or whether you're an immigrant that's married to a spouse. If your spouse is a US citizen, for example, your route to voting and to becoming a US citizen is about five years. In some cases, it can be three years. Um, and so this is all sort of federal law and changing all of these things. Um, so I guess the correct answer is it could range from three years uh, up to 10 years, depending on your status. But generally, if you are married to a US citizen, no matter what your category is, your wait time is gonna be shorter uh, to, to apply for citizenship than the citizen pro citizenship process is obviously a little bit longer. What about the people that enlist in the military? <laughs> I will recognize Ruth. So the question is, what about the, the people that enlist in the military? They're getting citizenship automatically, or what? No, uh, they're not. There's some sort of loophole in the law that allows uh, certain members of the military to to become U.S. Res uh, to become U.S. legal permanent residents, but as part of the discussion that you may have, some of you may have heard, but in part of the discussion they're having in the House, um, the, the part of the defense authorization bill is actually providing a pathway for people that join the military to become U.S. citizens, and that's not quite yet. Um, it's not law yet. And then, Brian. Um, yeah, hi, I'm Brian with the uh, San Diego Socialist Campaign. Um, so. I really liked, I just wanted to, um, I want to ask a question based on something that uh, Sandra and Sarah both mentioned. I mean, it's all really well and good to talk about working for the people, but the fact of the matter is too many politicians are really only accountable to their biggest donors. Um, so my real question is, um, do you plan on taking money from police unions and corporations? And if so, how on earth can you possibly say that you can work for the working class or people of color in this community? Thank you. I think I already answered that, no. <laughs> um, and corporations, honestly, I don't think that corporations and police union are really gonna wanna give me money. Um, so, but if they do, I will, I do not. I think the thing that will be special about my campaign and possibly some others is that I wanna, I wanna run a grassroots campaign. And I think that the community can raise all the money that we need um, to change politics in San Diego. Well, donations are limited to individuals, um, so all donations that would be coming would be from individuals. Yeah. Well, yeah. but that would be separate from the campaign, from my own campaign. Um, I'd be taking money from individuals. And and I also wanted to add that, um, you know, there's all sorts of, you know, special interests, even the unions are special interests, and I've always said that I'm, um, independent from either side. I want to listen to all issues first and then make decisions. So even though I do have, you know, union background, um, I never sell myself out to anybody ever. I want to make decisions that are good for District 9 and not for anybody, you know, one way or the other. Well, I also, like Sarah, I doubt that I'll get any police money or corporation money. I too am committed in running a grassroots campaign. That's what I'm building towards. Um, I really want to work in, in really connecting with the residents and really run a people's campaign. I don't just 
just I just want to clarify, I do not think the unions are a special interest. They do represent the working class and we need to lift that up. And, and, and I say that I, I really mean it because right now we are in this environment when where the workers are getting dem demonized. And I think it's wrong and we really need to stand for that and that's, that's what I'm all about. I just want to echo um, labor units. My husband's a social worker. He goes into people's houses unescorted um, by the police. He went into a Ku Klux Klan member's house in uh, Fallbrook. I'm always going to stand up for working class people because it's in my blood. And if people, and, and if you know, it's it's it is what it is. Workers, unions represent workers, and I'm always going to be there with them. Period. And then, uh, you've been, uh, John, a long time. Is it uh, Gregory? So let's, um, Oren, and then Gregory, and then you. So this should be quick. Um, why is it important for a candidate to be uh, from District 9, live in District 9? I think it's because you see the struggle every day. You know, nobody's telling you. You see, when I was canvassing here, I, um, I mean, even the, the body language, you know, of the people when you were talking about how it will be fifteen dollars an hour better for them, for their families. We cannot lie, you know, we cannot, I'm sorry for this, we cannot bullshit each other. We know what it is about, we, we know that, we know the struggles there. Nosotros sabemos la lucha, lo que están batallando ellos porque pertenecemos al mismo grupo. Es importante, es importante para que te, cono, que te conectes con, con la lucha, con, la, con el sufrimiento que cada trabajador tiene. Eh, vuelvo a mencionar el, el, el trabajo eh, y el sufrimiento de, de la persona indocumentada porque si uno con documentos que te fueron dados o como, como sea, eh, batallas y sufres porque te quitan los beneficios o porque ganas muy poco y no sabes qué hacer para proveer a tus hijos, imaginas el no tener documentos aquí y, y levantarte todos los días pensando qué tal si... Entonces, es importante que conozcas, que tengas una relación y que sepas con qué tipo de gente estás, estás trabajando. She also wanted to uh, re-emphasize the importance of supporting the immigrant issues and struggles, particularly the undocumented folks who mentioned in her prior comment, but I, I forgot to translate, pay taxes, mm -hmm. they pay sales taxes, they pay uh, 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 transportation tax, they, uh, yeah. they pay a contribution to society. Um, and so uh, it's super important to be able to put yourself in their shoes, recognize their struggles, and be able to give them a voice. So I feel pretty passionately about this. I think that people who run in this district should live in this district. I both live and work in this district. Um, you know, there's a phrase everybody kind of knows, it's called carpet bagging. Um, that actually came um, w when it was slavery. So a, a bunch of people, carpet, the people who had carpet bags were really affluent people. Um, so a lot of them went down to the South to take advantage of the chaos there. Um, and I think it's very relevant to um, this race currently. Um, we don't have a candidate who might be a potential candidate um, who most likely will have Republican backing, has a lot of money himself, um, and he plans to move into this district to be our savior. Um, and I don't think that that's acceptable. I think that the people in this neighborhood, undocumented folks who live in this neighborhood, documented folks who live in this neighborhood who should have a chance to represent the neighborhood they live and work in. Um, yeah. You know, somebody, <laughs> when I criticized this too, um, you know, I was like, well, you know, I was like, well, this person just moved in the district just to run. They're like, well, that's the game. The point is, we don't want to play that game. This is our neighborhood, um, and people who run for this position need to live here um, because these are our neighbors and these are our family members. Thank you. Yeah.
Um, Gregory, you're next. Here's that 2,300 families in San Diego get disconnected from water every year because of affordability. Prices are going to continue to go up, and we're 10 months out from using up our reserves, and not having the reserves to make water quotas as they stand. Would the candidates uh, support a moratorium on development, redevelopment, and, and guess the increases until we actually secure the water supply needed to service current population? Um, I think there's, there are things that we currently should be doing that we're not doing to ensure that we're protecting our water. There is, currently there's already a water shortage, but yet the city's not doing enough to, to make us all responsible to use less water. So we really need to work on that. In terms of a moratorium on construction, new development, that's hard to say. Because really, there, there's, there's things that need to be developed in this community, such as affordable housing, that it's important. So to, to not allow that to occur, I think is wrong. And it's not being responsive to the residents of this district. But there are things that we should be doing, much more things in term, to, to reduce our water use. There's also great water, reclaimed water that the city doesn't allow it, or if you can, you actually can, it's very expensive. So to do reclaim water, which I've done in my home, um, you, there's, there's ways to use less water that we can consume by reclaiming that water even more. We have, I forget what it's called now, the name has changed, it used to be called uh, Tap to Toilet. Um, pure water, pure water now. Um, when it wasn't popular, that's the way that it was referred to. Now it's referred to as pure water. Well, in order to get that, it's going to take, I believe we have a prediction of over 15 years. I think it's even longer uh, that we're going to be making that infrastructure available to be able to use that water. I think there are ways that we should reduce that period where we can currently use it now. Else? I want to echo um, what has been said. I, I could not support a moratorium on building because we desperately do need um, construction activity here. We need the housing. We need um, the, the the transportation. But uh, we also, I, you know, I do agree that we need to conserve water. And we need to um, when we do report it to. The city, for example, we do need officials to actually come out and do something about um, water waste. And so I, I could not support a moratorium, but um, I definitely see the concern regarding the water use because it is very important. Um, it, it should be a human right and, um, you know, it, it's, it's part of what makes uh, San Diego San Diego. It's, uh, you know, I know we talk about tourism and all that, but it's really um, you know, we're, we're a maritime city where, you know, we, we used to be founded on agricultural principles. Um, so uh, definitely uh, uh, water is very important, um, but no, uh, not a moratorium. Uh, there's other, other ways to deal with that issue, I think. I so most of the water used from agricultural, from raising beef and Oh, and alfalfa. Yeah. So maybe we can all become vegans. Um, okay, Martha. But that's a good segue because I would like to point out to everybody that residential use of water in California represents 4%. Mm -hmm. uh, animal agriculture represents 51%. So what will you as a a member of the city council do to inform your constituents and the rest of the city that the single biggest thing they can do to make more efficient use of our water resources is to eat less meat and dairy. Um, Sarah, you want to share? I'm going to disappoint you. I was a vegetarian for 10 years. I am no longer. But I, I completely agree. Um, 
I mean, you just educate the public. And I want to say, too, it's, I don't think there's a lot we can do from city council, and I think it's a, a systemic issue, right? It's a systemic issue of capitalism that we don't have enough water to drink. Um, it's a systemic issue why our environment is the way that it is. So I think that we need to start building critical consciousness in our communities and really pointing to the real issue, which is profit. Um, if you're out to make a profit, if the beef industry, the chicken industry, the agricultural industry, um, if their only bottom line is profit, that's the problem. Um, so we can have minor solutions, but what we have to talk about is real systemic change. So, so the next time I do one of these forums, we're going to have the Twitter messages uh, projected, uh, because I think we can have some real um, discussions. <laughs> um, yes. I think a great idea would be to just like what's going on in the Copley Price YMCA that they have the, um, you know, the cooking classes where they can bring more of those to various locations in the community and teach people about, you know, good cooking alternatives that we make from all all our different cultures that we can cross teach each other. And, and then that would enrich our vegan, vegetarian diets that we wouldn't normally know um, to do. So um, that echoes on the recreation concerns that um, would it be helpful. Um, I'm actually a vegan. And so this is a very interesting discussion. And I, don't, and I, and I try to come to people about nutrition in a, in a very um, not direct way because I'm, I'm, I'm about trying to respect people's customs and cultures. But really, if we think about the diet that is, I don't know what the percentage is, but you know the different cultures that we have in this community, a lot of it is based in vegetarianism, right? So I think District 9 might be doing its part. That's what I think. Um, should we be having more conversations about diet? Yes, and I agree with Sarah. Profit has a lot of influences in um, in in farming, right? But we're not talking about local farming. We're talking about great, massive farming, and that's different. There's been a huge investment in City Heights to provide more locally urbanized gardens, and we need to do that even more. I helped out in that, so we definitely need to do more of that. Where our food is coming from. Is now being imported. We have very little food being being grown in our communities. So we need to start changing that because we the environment cannot sustain itself. It's not even water. It's going to be air, water. So it's the basics of what's keeping us alive. So we definitely need to start those conversations at a higher level. So, okay. So uh, I need to go back to the $15 an hour. I agree that, that we need to change, but um, unfortunately for low-income families, it's cheaper to buy beef and with meat than to buy vegetables. We know how to eat, and in El Condado, when we get food stamps, de, de, ellos dicen que nosotros no sabemos cómo comer y tratan de educarnos. Nosotros sabemos cómo comer, pero no nos alcanza. Es mucho más fácil consumir carne que consumir um, verduras y frutas que les va a servir más a nuestros hijos. Entonces vuelvo otra vez a lo mismo, a que necesitamos en esta campaña luchar por 15 dólares la hora para poder alimentar mejor a nuestras familias. The, uh, uh, the, the administrators there are always trying to counsel immigrants on how properly they should eat, but real, realistically, is they, don't, they don't need counseling on um, uh, proper diet. They know the proper diet, but what we do need is $50 an hour. Right. To better eat, to eat better eat vegetables and have that switch of, of better foods, right? Exactly. Instead of meat. That's unfortunate. That is killing us. But Sorry. No. Hello everyone, my name is Abdul Muhammad, I'm part of City Heights, Momentum Team formerly, and I'm part of Alliance San Diego, and I have a question for all you guys, Council. We're on the new, you know, potential candidate. Uh, I want to know pretty much, I know that I hear all you guys' good ideas and whatnot, and 
you know, since I've always been to council offices, I hear a lot of talk and a lot of things that people claim that they want to do, but then when you get to the offices, you know, a lot of power behind the scenes and whatnot, are you guys going to keep the integrity of representing the people, or are the effects going to distort the messages that you guys want to portray? This is going to be the last question. It is uh, 8.30. <laughs> um, okay, so I think I have Abdul. I serve on the Mid-City Can board with Abdul. He's an amazing community activist. I think one of the best ways to um, keep yourself grounded is to surround yourself. I've seen uh, the staff on the 10th floor is like revolving. It's the same people going from council district to council district. I think that you need people from the community to be around you. So I'm committed to having people from the community. I would love you to apply if I run. Like people from the community need to staff this office. And right now, um, I'm not sure how many people staff that office right now. I know that there's not um, a Vietnamese person on staff. I know that there's not an East African person on staff. So we have to surround ourselves with people from the community so they keep us grounded and, and keep us on point with what we promised the constituents. To answer your question, yes. And that's why I'm being completely honest about one, giving you specifics about what I wanna do, and two, where I stand on my positions. So that gives you a better opportunity to make the choice that you need to make at the ballot box. I'll give you a one word answer, yes. <laughs> Um, same here. My entire life has been about um, partnering with the community, the, 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 the folks that are impacted by decisions. That's what I've done for, for forever. And I will continue doing that work. I'm not doing it to benefit myself. I'm doing it to truly represent the community with the community. And uh, my last comment is, um, I'm a writer of, uh, for the workers' struggles. Um, I'm also doing my master's, and my thesis is food stamps for low-income mothers, undocumented parents of American uh, citizen children who don't apply for benefits because they are afraid of the connection of ICE and, and the government, the Border Patrol, and they, they don't want to lose their children for $400 a month. So definitely I'm part of this. Uh, if you want to read my article, Sandra Galindo, social medium at City Times, City College, I'm, I'm part of this. I'm a socialist since I remember, but I have to migrate from Mexico to here to feel empowered. And I'm here to help my community. I don't know if I'm going to run, but I'm doing really this because, as I said before, I'm a mother with dog, luckily to have documents, and I'm struggling so much. I even called Carmen Lopez once, once, and I asked her for a job. I was desperate, working for $5 an hour, and I know what it is to struggle. So I just imagine all the parents with no documents and no boys waking up every day, you know, feeling this, this uh, anxiety and, and, and hopelessness to, to maybe they're going to be separated from their families and, and it's, it's just terrible. It's, it's just terrible. So we need to work for this community, the undocumented community, the documented community who are the base of, of this country. And no, I will not. <laughs> over a couple of times. Hi, Nick, is you, it's your turn. Thank you. But this is the last question. <laughs> I'm honored. Uh, Jamie Edmonds uh, from Transition San Diego. Um, transition program would apply to a lot of the issues you guys are talking about, works on water, energy, food, transportation, waste, struggles that we're all dealing with. Unfortunately, it doesn't wait for the politicians to fix it. It kind of does it at a grassroots level. But my question is, are you aware of the clean elections campaign that we're trying to get on the ballot? Would you support that? It's publicly funded elections. Because I hear the kind of questions about, would you take money from this business and that union and this special interest and these cops and all that? Yeah. That is the problem. Mm -hmm. And I'm not interested in working on the symptoms. I want to treat the root causes, get the money out of the elections, and have the people start taking care of themselves, get more resilient and sustainable in providing their communities with a community that we used to have back when I was a kid, when Zoo was free until you were 16. <laughs> you know? And um, I just want to hear your comments on the clean election campaign. It sounds like an oxymoron, but we're getting it on the campaign on the ballot in 2016. That would allow more people like yourselves and more people that don't have money interest behind them to run and represent the people in this district. 
I've already signed, I've already endorsed that campaign. I think it's a, it's a good campaign that would provide anybody to be able to run for, say, for any, uh, of any positions. I think it's critical. So I'm already on board. Yeah. Yeah, 100% on board. I think Citizens United was one of the worst things to ever happen uh, to our democracy. <laughs> um, so I would 100% support that. Um, I mean, I know that a lot of, I mean, just from working from United Taxi Workers, I'm very aware of where people get their money. Um, if they get them from permit holders, um, developers, you owe those people favors, right? So you're not really running for the people, you're running for the corporations. So I 100% think that is fundamental to returning democracy to our country, so yeah. I absolutely agree. Same here, I agree with clean elections. I will support everything that supports and helps our, our communities to live with dignity. to say one thing. She came here from Texas, so... Well, she was on vacation and rushed to go. I just got off the plane. I'd just like to say every single one of you should carry uh, voter registrations in your car. They are. They are. Okay? And, and also help people fill them out correctly. One of the a big problem... I don't, in Chula Vista, there was a, um, an election that was lost by two votes. Yeah. Okay, so it's very important that people fill it out correctly when you are asking people to do it, if they allow you to look it over. Because uh, unfortunately, a lot of people don't complete it correctly. They think they're registered to vote, but they're not. They go vote and then that vote does not count. So again, it's better to talk to 10 people, invest five minutes, of your time in asking them to engage and why, why they don't vote, do it correctly, and I think every single one of us um, can get people a better turnout for this coming election. Thank you. Uh, one, more, one more thing before we end this part of the program. Uh, we need to recognize Melinda uh, Chipmont. Uh, she's the uh, Aja uh, Center um, Executive Director. So, Melinda. Yay. Did I pronounce your name correctly? Did I pronounce it? Shamant. Okay. Um, so we thank you for letting us um, meet here, and we also want to give another big hand to our panelists, to, to Carmen, Actually, a meeting um, after this. You're welcome to stay. You're welcome to join us, um, but um, it's it's kind of late, so just know that it, we won't be embarrassed if you do leave. Um, just yes. Kelly? I, I just want to say that there are groups working on voter registration around the Code 182.5. so much for coming. Thank you. The club members, the club members, I do ask you to stay. We have business.